Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I have with me today State Health Officer Dr. Jimmy Guidry uh, and Dr. Lacey Cavanaugh, who's the Regional Medical Director for Region 5 of, of the Louisiana Department of Hospitals, that is the Lake Charles area. That's one of our areas of great concern. Uh, you saw the, the slides on Monday uh, that showed increasing cases and hospitalizations uh, in Regions 4, 5, and 6. Uh, and really more broadly than that, but most pronounced in those three regions. So we thought we would bring Lacey uh, in today so she could speak specifically about her observations there, which are pretty much the same as, as in other parts of the state. Do want to advise everyone in case they haven't seen it, there is a tornado warning. In fact, I think it may have just expired at 3.30 uh, in Ascension, East Baton Rouge, Iberville, and West Baton Rouge parishes. Uh, they may have been extended, but obviously there is severe weather uh, moving through the area uh, as we speak and asking people to be careful. And I'll get back more on the weather towards the end of my prepared comments. As you know, on Monday, I announced that the state is going to remain, <coughs> excuse me, the state's going to remain in phase two instead of moving to phase three at the end of this week when the current proclamation expires. So on Thursday, tomorrow, we will issue a new proclamation uh, that will be effective for 28 days. Um, now, we may or may not stay in phase two for that full 28 days. We're going to take a hard look uh, at the data in 14 days and in, and in uh, 21 days if, if necessary. Um, on uh, Monday, I announced that decision. Yesterday, we reported a very large number of cases, and we're, report we're reporting a large number of cases today. And I think these numbers make crystal clear the correctness of the decision not to move forward. Uh, we're just not ready. We're not meeting the gating criteria that was set forth in the phased reopening plan issued by the White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, that has been vetted by the CDC and certainly has been vetted here in Louisiana by our own health professionals. Today, we're reporting 882 new cases for a total of 52,477. Now, that is less today than the 1,356 we reported yesterday, but 1,356 is one of the highest daily totals that we have reported ever, and certainly the highest since, I think, way back at the beginning of, of April. Um, so this trend that we're seeing over the last couple of days is very concerning. Uh, simply put, we're heading in the wrong direction. Uh, we have more cases than we can justify just by the fact that we're doing more testing. And as I'll get into a little bit later, our positivity, uh, the percentage of tests that are, that are coming out positive is actually uh, growing uh, as well. Um, I will tell you that we were at number two in cases per capita at one time. We, we were improving in, uh, steadily uh, for a number of weeks, and we actually uh, got to number 10. Uh, we are at number 7 today, uh, and uh, we, have, we have leapfrogged over uh, Delaware, Illinois, and Maryland. Uh, and so, so that's not what we want to be doing. We want to be going the other way on that list. Sadly, today we are reporting 18 new deaths. That's a total of 3,039 deaths. We have 631 patients in the hospital across the state of Louisiana with COVID-19. Uh, the good news is that's 15 less than yesterday's number. However, if you look out over the last week to 10 days, we have had a, a steady, uh, all but, I'll, I'll be at, uh, a relatively uh, a modest increase in overall hospitalizations. With uh, 77 of those patients on ventilators, and that's six fewer than yesterday that are on mechanical ventilators. The biggest increase uh, in cases uh, in Louisiana is in the 18 to 29 year old group. Uh, we've seen upticks in young people younger than 18 and in people aged 30 to 39, uh, but in that 18 to 29 group is where we're seeing the largest increase. Uh, I'll tell you that we've had more than 2,300 children under the age of 18 to test positive for COVID. Nearly 9,000 people in the 18 to 29 age group have tested positive for COVID, and this age group now, as I mentioned, is outpacing all the others. 
uh, in total cases. More than 8,300 people in the 30 to 39 age group have had COVID, and this is the third greatest share of cases after the 18 to 29 and the 50 to 59 age group. Um, and this is uniform across the state of Louisiana. I think Lacey's going to talk about this. Uh, the growth in recent cases among young people is happening in all nine regions of our state. Nobody is immune from this virus. Everyone who gets it is subject to having a poor outcome, either a serious illness, may or may not require hospitalization, may in fact uh, die, although the, the likelihood of that is certainly lower than in other age groups, but it, it certainly could happen. And then the damage that this disease can do to your body uh, is something that may last for a very long time, it may last forever. Uh, so I do want to make sure that the young people are listening and that they know that, because I know that typically young people believe they're invincible, uh, that they're not invincible, they're not impervious to this virus. Our percent positive remains under 10%, um, and you know that's been a goal of ours. However, it has been edging up, uh, and it is 7%, uh, and, and this increase going up is, is uh, concerning. Yes, we're going to see more cases because we're testing more. Um, but when we see an increased percentage of those tests coming back positive, that tells us without a doubt that the virus is spreading in our community. We also know that less than 10% of the new cases are in congregate settings. So not only is the virus growing, it is community spread. That's what's causing this. Uh, I will tell you here in Louisiana, we were going to test as many people as we can, um, because that's important. Uh, it, you're going to have the cases whether you test or not, right? But if you don't test, you don't know where the cases are, and you can't implement strategies uh, in order to try to uh, get them under control. Right now, we've conducted uh, right at 650,000 tests since the start of this public health emergency. You know that our monthly goal for May and June is 200,000 tests. Here we are on June the 24th. Uh, we have conducted 245,375 tests thus far in the month of June. Um, and in fact, over 30,000 tests just in the last two days. And I want to thank all of our partners, all of our federal partners uh, at FEMA and HHS and so forth for helping us to get um, much of the testing materials that we need, but also I want to thank uh, all of our uh, hospitals and clinics and, and universities and everybody uh, at FEMA uh, who's helping, but also at, the, at GOSEP and the National Guard and certainly all the folks at LDH. We still have a lot of work to do, uh, and, and we are, are working uh, extremely hard. Testing is a huge component of that work. I uh, also want to give you an update on the nursing homes. As of June the 22nd, LDH has conducted 525 virtual or on-site infection control and assessment response visits, and they call them ICAR visits, uh, to nursing homes across the state of Louisiana. As of June the 19th, 85% of all nursing home residents have been tested. 70% of all nursing staff have been tested. LDH, as you know, it distributed a Medicaid mandate letter to all nursing homes on June the 17th. Nursing homes will have until June 30th to do their baseline testing, which means 100% uh, of their uh, residents and their staff. Uh, and then they will have to test again by July 14th on all those who tested negative. Uh, I have uh, with me today, as I mentioned, Dr. Lacey Cavanaugh, who's the Regional Medical Director uh, for Region 5 in the Lake Charles area. Uh, she's going to come up and she's going to discuss what she's seeing in the area, uh, in that area of the state. Um, sometimes we focus on New Orleans and Baton Rouge, and especially New Orleans, because at the beginning of this public health emergency, as you all know, um, it, it, it in Jefferson Parish had uh, just tremendous case growth and hospitalizations and, and so forth. But I think it's good that we've, we look at other areas uh, as well. So she's going to speak to you about that. Uh, and uh, then I will, I will uh, come back up um, and, and uh, introduce Dr. Guidry, who's going to come up uh, and, and speak a little bit. And then I'll come follow up uh, after that and take your questions. So Lacey, if you would. Hi, 
good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a little bit of background on me. I'm actually a small town uh, family doc um, from Louisiana, and uh, I serve as the regional medical director for the Office of Public Health for Region 5, which is Lake Charles area. I serve a five parish region. Um, as part of that role, um, just to give you some context for um, what I have to share today, is that I work with um, many community partners, including school systems, local government, local media. We actually host a very similar event um, in Lake Charles where we do press briefings um, for COVID-19 on the local level pretty frequently. Um, I also lead a team of local public health professionals across the region that are um, very much on the front lines of this COVID-19 fight. Um, I'd like to start by telling a little success story following up with the governor's um, talk of, of nursing homes is that this week my region successfully deployed our first contract um, team that is going on uh, and testing residents within um, the nursing homes. And it was a, a great success and uh, really is working on building partnerships um, with those local facilities and I'm happy to report that. And it's definitely um, a milestone for, for my region. I'd like to make the point that, that COVID has really changed us all. Um, it's, it's been a challenge for everyone in, in different ways, um, both personally and professionally for me, it's been a challenge. I mean, working um, very hard against this fight and I have young children. So I, I just wanna recognize um, where people are with this. I know people are tired um, and I know that it seems like an invisible enemy, but um, I really and truly have confidence that we as a state and as a community can step up to the plate and combat um, this deadly disease. It has been a whirlwind um, and it is truly impacting Southwest Louisiana um, in a big way right now. We see that through increased testing demand. Our mobile testing site that is doing um, testing tested the most people that we've ever tested throughout this entire event um, yesterday. So the demands for testing has grown substantially because um, I think people are seeing the impacts in the community and are realizing that this, this is very, very real. Um, the other challenge is uh, there's still so much left to learn about this virus. We, we have learned a lot since, since the beginning, but we, we still have a long way to go. And sometimes those um, unanswered questions make us a little bit uneasy because we, we certainly like to know our enemy. But in this case, we're, we're still learning. Um, and that's uncomfortable, you know, it's uncomfortable sometimes. Um, Another way that, that I know that the concern in my community has increased is just the, the number of questions that I'm receiving. Actually, just on the drive over here today, I got a phone call about testing and questions about what testing is appropriate, you know? Can I go to the, the local clinic and get a finger prick or a blood draw? Or do, I, do I have to get a nose swab? Um, and, and that's a frequently asked question, so I'd like to address that and, and say that, um, you know, PCR testing, which is the nasal swab, is the way that we know if we have COVID right now. Um, although antibody testing uh, is out and available in the community, um, I've, I've seen cases where um, people think that they get an antibody test and that that means that it's okay to go out because they think that they're negative and they're good and that's really not how antibody testing is interpreted. And so um, these questions continue to come up and, and we are um, working very hard to address all of those concerns and really guide our, our community through um, all of these challenges and, and things that, that pop up on, on a daily basis. Um, another thing I, I'd like to mention is that I've seen in Southwest Louisiana over the past week a series of voluntary closures from businesses that are concerned about the rise in cases either um, in their staff or just in the community. And so um, I'm very proud of them for recognizing where we are right now um, in terms of our cases in Southwest Louisiana. And they've made very, very difficult decisions um, to, to close down for a little while um, while, while our community tries to, to recover from, um, from the virus and the increasing cases. And so I just, I applaud them for choosing to do the right thing for our community. Um, I'd also like to, to touch on the age groups that, that we're seeing. As you heard the governor say, um, the majority of the new cases have been young people. And it is easy when you're a young person to think that you're invincible um, and that, that you can 
go about your day and, and not worry about it because you're going to be fine from COVID. But that's not exactly the truth. I mean, I've taken care of, um, over the course of my career, many young people who thought they were invincible, who still um, wound up in critical care or in the hospital um, from, from making decisions that were risky. And so I encourage our young people to think about um, your own risk, but also to think about the risk of the ones that you love and that you visit, your family and your friends and your grandparents and all the other really important people um, in your life. Because if you get COVID and bring it to them, even if you're fine, they may not be. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, to leave with, um, now is not the time to freak out because the cases are increasing, but it is the time to really get serious about evaluating our personal behaviors and taking all the precautions um, that we can to protect ourselves. And that includes um, wearing a mask. And I know masks are uncomfortable. Um, I know they're hot. Um, I was sweating on the way over here wearing my mask, but I did it anyway. And I did it because um, I did it for my family, really. I did it for, for my family, my children, and my husband. And so I hope that, um, that many people will, will choose to do the same. And uh, I know that um, we can do it. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, for your insights. Um, you know, one of the best tools of defense at our disposal uh, is wearing a mask. And you've heard us say it. When you wear a mask, you're being a good neighbor because you're not doing that so much to protect yourself. You're doing that to protect the other people who are around you. Um, and we've had to say this an awful lot over the past few months. You hear it coming out of Washington and elsewhere. But we know that there are still some people who are questioning the importance uh, of wearing a mask. Uh, and I wanted to take a few minutes to address some common myths. And I've asked Dr. Guidry uh, to do that. Um, so he's going to He's going to go through uh, several myths around masks wearing and, and so forth. Uh, at the conclusion of his remarks, I will, I will come back up and, uh, and uh, conclude uh, the prepared remarks, and then we'll take your questions. Thank you, Governor. I didn't know if we had the slides today. Here we go. Myth number one, wearing a cloth mask doesn't work. So there are many people that think it doesn't work. So think of this virus as spreading in a mist, in liquid particles, and there's no barrier. So if I talk, if I sneeze, if I cough, what keeps it from going right there to this person a few feet away? This helps. Everything you do to make sure that you're not close to someone and you're wearing a mask protects the person that you're next to. And you're saying, well, that's, you know, wearing a cloth mask does work. It can effectively block the spread and, breath, and speech and breath droplets that spread it. And there has been many tests showing that this does work. So there are disbelievers, but we do know it, it works. And it's only a part of what we need to do that works, but it's an important part. Number two, if I'm not sick, I don't need to wear a mask. And so we see a lot of folks who feel good. They don't feel like they're putting anyone at risk and they refuse to wear a mask and they don't realize that this virus, if you have it, you can be asymptomatic and you can be spreading it. So it's a little effort and it may be a little uncomfortable, but we know that if you wear this mask, you're gonna minimize that exposure. And even if you're not you don't not sick, you could still be spreading COVID. And, and we've all heard about it. And now that we're doing all this testing, we're proving it over and over again. People with no symptoms testing positive. So we know that that's a fact. Just because you don't have symptoms doesn't, doesn't mean you can't spread it. Myth number three, if I wear a mask, I don't need to social distance and, I can, and avoid crowds. So I can put a mask on and I can go about my business and I don't have to worry about the distancing and I don't have to worry about going in large groups. That's a myth. You need layers of protection. You need the mask, you need to keep your distance, and you need to avoid large crowds. To show you what's happened through all of these events, when we first started seeing COVID, 
we saw a lot of the infection around and we started seeing it get into the vulnerable population, nursing homes. And then we did, with the governor's order, we got people to stay home. And we saw the virus slowly stop infecting people because they weren't going out and about, because they weren't taking risk. And we saw the numbers coming down. Then we started opening up in the phases and people don't think the virus is that much to worry about and so they're not doing the things they need to do. And so these myths are what's driving misinformation and not taking this virus seriously. And this virus is coming back and laughing at us and saying, I was just waiting for you to let up. I'm here and I, I'm gonna start infecting again. And it's gonna start in young people and then it's gonna get over to the vulnerable population. We know how it plays out because we witnessed it all through the spring. Myth number four, my mask just needs to cover my mouth. I can't tell you how often I go out and about and I see people wearing their mask and this is how they wear it. It's almost like a chin strap. And they got their mouth uncovered and they got their nose uncovered. How are you preventing these particles from going to the next person? That, that's not serving any purpose. I see people with this. They think I'm not spitting, I'm not coughing, but your nose is where air is moving. It's where the fluids are moving. So anything that comes out of your nose or your mouth can be infectious. And the whole intent of the mask, along with social distancing, along with avoiding crowds, is to keep this virus under control. So we've been saying it over and over again, but we see what happens when we don't take it seriously. And we let, you know, we let up on our guard and we wanna go back to normal lives. But we need to do these things to make sure we, as we get back to near normal, that we're not compromising folks that are at risk, businesses, I mean businesses that have been closed for months now have to close again because we're not wearing a mask and keeping our social distancing. So we jeopardize the economy, we jeopardize lives when we don't take these simple measures seriously. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Dr. Gidry. And, and as I mentioned on Monday, I have no doubt um, that we can have the businesses open that are open in phase two. We can have people going back to work and back into stores and restaurants and places of worship uh, with the easing of restrictions, uh, of restrictions that we that we've been able to uh, to do, but only if they do follow these mitigation measures. Uh, and in in the grand scheme of things, it's not asking too much. It's asking very little, uh, and and only through doing that can we achieve the greatest degree of normalcy. And it won't be normal, but the greatest degree of normalcy. Uh, and then not risk having to go backwards uh, with putting more restrictions in place. So thank you very much, Dr. Guidry, and thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh, as well. So we've had some uh, dangerous weather conditions this week, including today uh, here in the Baton Rouge region. Uh, there are no reports, I'm happy to say, of any uh, widespread problems or injuries, uh, but we do know that some bad weather went through last night, that New Orleans has dealt with some flash flooding issues, uh, because of heavy rainfall earlier today. And you know, the, we typically see these weather patterns in the summer. Um, heavy rains and thunderstorms can happen on, on an almost daily basis. Uh, but this is why we stress get a game plan. So get a game plan uh, by going to getagameplan.org. Uh, we are in hurricane season as we get towards the end of this first month of hurricane season. Uh, we've got a long way to go. Uh, and as you all know, uh, over the last number of years, the most activity uh, from hurricane season it typically happens in the August, September, uh, and sometimes even in, in October. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to thank you again for coming today, and I will, I will take a few questions uh, from you if you have any. Yes, sir. Governor, uh, we found this out the last week of the legislative session. Uh, can you talk about the, uh, looks like lawmakers are going to try to pass out some tax breaks and pay for them with unclaimed property money. Uh, do you support that approach? And do you also support the bill uh, by uh, Clay Schecksnyder in his current form on the tort reform? Okay. Um, there, there are some serious issues with the, the speaker's bill 
um, and I had an opportunity to speak to him uh, about that bill and and obviously I'd like to, to see some improvements made to it and there's, there's still plenty of time. Uh, with respect to um, the unclaimed property, you know we've had unclaimed property that's been in the forecast and then been appropriated as a recurring, a recurring source of revenue for a very long time. So it's entirely appropriate to incorporate that money into the budget uh, and within reason uh, to the degree that we can uh, we can pay for uh, any uh, assistance to businesses and, and others in, in the form of, uh, of well thought out reasonable uh, uh, tax credits and so forth then then certainly that's something that I can I can support the devil is always in the details obviously not every instrument that passed uh, or that has been considered uh, needs to make its way all the way through um, but but uh, if the legislature is, is selective on that and does uh, uh, what we can afford to do, then then yeah, I don't I don't have any any problems with that. What about the idea that the, uh, the Senate finance looks like they're not going to allow pay raises in the next fiscal year, uh, which would I guess save about sixty million dollars. Do you agree with that approach? Well, I, I really don't, and and. Uh, I'm hopeful that they won't do that, and I know there's been some talk about either not doing it or, or maybe uh, in terms of not allowing the pay raise uh, or maybe delaying them uh, for some period of time in order to achieve some savings that can be put into the budget. Uh, I don't believe that that, that, that is necessary and, and that we should do that at this time. Yes? Well, they certainly have that right, um, and and as you know, they can do things that are more restrictive uh, than what I put in place through my proclamations. Uh, they can't be less restrictive. Uh, but my appeal is to the people of Louisiana, um, and the information that is coming out of the CDC, out of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. You look at Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, all of those, all of those individuals. Uh, masks are very, very important. And in fact, I will tell you, we're not going to be able to uh, successfully uh, reopen more of our economy and, and uh, ease restrictions w without seeing cases spike unless more people do a better job of wearing their masks, keeping uh, their distance away from people not in their immediate household, uh, washing their hands frequently, and staying home when they're sick. I mean, it's, we, we've said it so many times, and I know people are tired of hearing it, uh, but the simple fact of the matter is more people need to do it. Um, and and uh, so my appeal is to, to the people of Louisiana to make sure that, that they do more uh, of these things. And, and like Dr. Guidry said, it's just incredibly important. Uh, and it's, it's about being a good neighbor. And so many people will say, well, I feel fine. I, I, I don't believe I have the virus. That just totally misses the point that 25 to 40 percent of the people who have it and are contagious are asymptomatic so yeah they're going to feel fine and other people who become symptomatic started spreading uh, the virus uh, 48 hours before so saying i'm going to wait until i don't feel well in order to wear a mask well first of all if you don't feel well you need to stay home but, but secondly, if you wait until then, you're just putting people at risk, and, and we, we shouldn't do that. Um, and we're asking people to be a good neighbor, and the people of Louisiana know how to do that. Uh, we do need to get more, more compliance. Yes, sir. Has contact tracing been the effective tool that we were hoping it would be in the fight against the coronavirus, and are young people especially complying with contact tracing and answering the questions the state workers are asking? Yeah, and, and I'm not going to be able to distinguish between the responsiveness of young people as opposed to others. And, and if, if Dr. Guidry knows the answer to that question, I, I will certainly let him come and, and answer it. Contract tracing is as, as good as people listening and, and following through. So if, I, if you get a case and... and I get calls every day about people, what do I do with this? Somebody showed up at work. Right now, many of the daycare employees 
are young people that are out of school. They're people that are in college and it's a summer job. And they went out and some of their friends had COVID. What do I do with my daycare? So contact tracing actually helps answer some of that. Now, whether people follow the guidance or not, whether young people follow the guidance or not, that, that's a question that's, that's human behavior, but there's someone's got to talk to them and give them good advice. And whether they follow the advice or not depends on whether they take it seriously. I can tell you that when I'm talking to a daycare owner and her workforce, uh, that she doesn't know if they have COVID and she's got the care of all these children that these parents have to go to work, that owner is really worried about, am I exposing these young kids? Uh, do they need to go get a test? Contact tracing does that for you. You have been exposed. This is what you need to do. This is where you need to go. And if you can't isolate at home, we can help you figure out how to get your groceries to you and, and keep you isolated. So it is an opportunity to get these things done, but people have to trust that and they have to do what is offered to, to protect others. So if you wear the mask, keep your distance, and you don't get exposed, that's best. But if you get exposed, then you gotta stay home and isolate until you know if you get the virus or not. And, and that's where contact tracing comes in. Is it as good as we would like? Well, obviously not because people are, some people are not taking this seriously with all that we've been talking. It's better than not having it, I'll say that. But we still have to work at what is the messaging, what is the advice, and, and, and keep working at trying to get people's attention. When you start seeing more and more cases, as we have this week at different work sites, then people are paying attention to our advice. Then contact tracing becomes a resource to give good medical advice. Until you start seeing cases, you don't think it applies to you. This week, a lot of people think it applies to them. I'm hearing from a lot more people because the cases are going back up and they're, they're being taken by surprise. So I don't have a, an easy answer, but I think it'll get more uh, to where people will need it if they continue to see spikes. They're gonna need this advice that on a, on a regular basis because you don't know whether you should go to work. You don't know whether your business should be open. There's a lot of questions once you have an exposure. Thank you. And, you know, some people, I think, believe that contact tracing was just invented in order to deal uh, with COVID-19. It's been around a very long time, and it's been used around the world, around the country, and here in Louisiana uh, with respect to multiple uh, contagious diseases. Um, and, and it is entirely uh, confidential. Uh, and so we are asking uh, people, and, and look, we appreciate those who, who do answer the phone and those people who do comply and give, give the requisite information. Obviously, not everybody is doing that. Um, and, and yeah, you've heard me say it before, they have a right not to participate. But not participating is not the right thing to do. And so we are asking for, for, for people to, to participate better. A couple more questions and then we'll we'll wrap up unless that's it all right well thank you very much i think we will see you um next wednesday same time same place if that changes we will let you know thank you and god bless